This video will provide setup instructions for the DCS100E and the DCS103E controllers. Despite the differences between these two controllers, their setup process is essentially the same. So for the purposes of this video, we'll be demonstrating setup with just one controller. If you do want to learn more about the differences between these controllers or about a specific controller's unique features, you can navigate to that controller's product page on the Advanced Illumination website, where you'll find more resources and information. So let's go over the DCS controller basics. There are two setup environments for all DCS controllers. There's the hardware environment, which includes the controller, the light, the power supply, and all preferred I.O. components. And then there's the software environment, which includes the graphical user interface used in managing your light's operation. In this video, we'll go over the setup procedures for both the hardware and software components of your controller, and we'll also discuss how to utilize the graphical user interface to manage your light settings. This video will have timestamps in the description, so go ahead and skip to a specific part of the setup process if you need to. Now, let's get started. Both DCS controllers have integrated 35mm DIN rail clips for mounting. This clip can be actuated towards the bottom of the controller for easy removal. The first step to get your controller up and running is to connect your power supply. These controllers require a 24 volt DC power supply with a recommended output power of 4.5 amps. It's always best practice when setting up a controller to connect all I.O. components before powering on, so keep your power supply powered off during setup. To connect your power supply, wire the flying leads from the power supply into the input power connector. The input power connector along with the trigger connector is located at the bottom of the controller. Both of these connectors can be detached from the controller to make wiring easier, which is handy if your controller is already mounted. To detach a connector, simply pull on the tab and slide the connector out of its socket. Then you can wire in your leads and reattach the connector. Of course, you also have the option of wiring with the connectors still attached to the controller, whichever is easiest for you. To wire in your input power supply, insert your positive lead into terminal 1 and tighten the screw until you have enough engagement. The terminal should clamp down on your lead and hold it in place. Do the same with the negative lead in terminal 2. Note that the recommended cable gauge for power leads is 18 American wire gauge, with an absolute minimum of 22. The process is similar for wiring in triggers. The DCS100E and 103E allow up to three trigger inputs, all of which use terminal 1 on the trigger connector as common ground, so we'll wire our negative lead into terminal 1. Terminals 2, 3, and 4 on the connector are used for trigger inputs 1, 2, and 3. In this video, we'll be demonstrating a trigger with input 1, so we'll wire our positive lead into terminal 2 on the trigger connector. The next step is to connect your lights. Make sure the pins on your C1 connector are aligned and tighten until fully seated. The connector should thread in smoothly. Make sure not to force it and be careful to avoid cross-threading. Also be careful not to loosen the connector shroud. Finally, plug in your ethernet cord. Now that all I.O. components are connected, we can power on the controller and check the LED indicators. The green LED indicates that the controller has power. The amber LED acts as a status indicator which blinks slowly on and off when the controller is functioning properly. Finally, there are three yellow LEDs to indicate trigger signals. Since we wired our trigger into input 1, the first LED, which you see blinking here, indicates our trigger signal. So that's it for hardware. In the next steps, we'll go over how to install the software and operate your DCS controller. Navigate to the product page for your DCS controller on the Advanced Illumination website. In the download section, click the link to download the graphical user interface. Opening this file will bring up the setup application for your DCS controller software.
Click through the setup process to install the software. If you're using an older version of the controller, you may have to update its firmware. To do that, first check the label on your controller to see which version you're using, if it's Rev Dash or Rev A. Then, you can once again navigate to your controller's product page, and in the download section, click the link to download the corresponding version of the firmware for your controller. This file will contain the most recent firmware as well as a firmware updater, which must be installed. Click through the setup application to install the firmware updater. Once complete, open the updater, select your device, and update it with the most recent firmware version. Now that your controller hardware is connected and the software is installed, it's time to operate your controller. If connecting to a DHCP-enabled network, then an unused IP address will automatically be assigned to your controller and should become active within 10 seconds. If connecting directly to a PC, or a network that isn't DHCP-enabled, then the controller will begin with a default static IP address of 192.168.0.1. Once the software recognizes the controller on your network, you can select your device's IP address from the device's drop-down menu and click Connect to establish a connection. If a valid light is connected to the controller, the channels will populate with slider and text box controls. If you're using a DCS-103E as we are in this instance, then each of the three channels in the software GUI will correspond with the three outputs on the controller. If you're using a DCS-100E, which features only one output but with three independent light channels, then the channels on the software will control these light channels respectively. After establishing a connection, you can change your controller's IP address in the Manage Devices menu. Once the user enters a custom IP address, the controller will begin using that address upon startup until the controller is reset, so make sure the new IP address is noted. You also have the ability to set device names from this menu, which can be useful when configuring more than one controller. In this case, we'll name our controller Site Inspection 2. Our DCS-100E and 103E controllers also offer a web-based graphical user interface using a RESTful API. This allows for easy configuration of the device without needing device-specific libraries, and can be useful on networks where firewall settings may block uncommon ports. To access the web GUI, enter the IP address of the controller in a web browser. This GUI offers the same controls that you'll find in the software. If you need to change a subnet mask or gateway address, you can do it here in the Network Settings menu. Now that the software has established a connection, you can manage your light settings. Choose your desired light mode from the Mode drop-down menu. Select Continuous Mode if you want your light to be always on. Select Gated Mode if you only need your light to be on for certain intervals at continuous current levels. Remember that earlier we wired our trigger into Input 1, so we'll select Input 1 from the drop-down menu to activate our trigger. Select Pulsed Mode if you want to overdrive your light over short pulses. The main slider adjusts the amount of current your light will receive, and in the boxes underneath, you can adjust your trigger and pulse settings. Note that the parameters adjust automatically when switching modes. For example, switching to pulsed mode allows you to increase the current beyond continuous mode levels and therefore overdrive your light in short pulses. This is Advanced Illumination's signature technology at work. When operating any AI light with any discrete AI controller, our proprietary Signatech control system will automatically adjust the operating limits so that you can drive your lights to the max without risking any damage to the LEDs. Signatech bases these limits on the control mode the pulse width, 
the pulse frequency, and the characteristics of the connected light head. Because Signatech accounts for pulse frequency when calculating a maximum output current, you will see a pulse frequency limit here. If planning on driving your light beyond this limit, decrease the pulse width until you see a readout greater than the maximum pulse frequency required in your application. Be careful not to exceed this limit or you will experience skipped pulses as Signatech will maintain safe operating conditions in order to prevent the light from overheating. One last thing to note about the GUI is that once you configure your light settings, you have the option to save these settings as a profile that can be loaded back up later. This allows for easy switching between desired light settings. The controller automatically saves the last running settings, so if there is a loss of power or other reset of the controller, it will boot back up in the last used configuration profile. Okay, so now the setup process is complete. At this point, your controller is up and running and you should be utilizing your graphical user interface to manage your light settings. For additional information about the setup process, download your controller's product manual in the download section of the controller's product page on the Advanced Illumination website.